Would you have liked to have gotten this episode days ago? Ad free? Well, you can. Just go to patreon.com slash russocoon, TWC, and support the show. The show is the only black bald wrestling podcast in the entire world. And we really appreciate our Patreons, but you get a lot for your money if you go to patreon.com slash TWC. Not only do you get this show early, but you get bonus shows as many as four a month. And once in a while, we'll drop something free on there. And you can even do a level where you get t-shirts, phone calls from Vince, shout-outs, all kind of cool stuff. Just go to patreon.com slash TWC. Welcome to Truth With Consequences. I'm Matt Kuhn, and of course, I am here with the man, the architect of the Attitude Era, the infamous, the divisive, Mr. Vince <laughs> Russo. How are you doing today, man? I am doing all right, Mr. Matt Kuhn. I got to tell you, bro, you got this cool look. You got the you got the uh, Razor Ramon look uh, going on today. You got this little, this one little curl coming down over your forehead. Very cool, Mr. Kuhn. Well, yeah. let's talk a little bit about what's been going on. You know, the show is on a roll. The last two shows have been our highest downloaded shows. The TNA show was great. And a lot of people really loved the St. Valentine's Day Massacre show. A lot of great feedback. Uh, maybe more people remember that or are interested in that than you remember? Or is the feedback about what you'd expect? No, nah, bro. I, I think there's a lot more to talk about and a lot more to discuss than, you know, what what's, what, what's you know, just dragged through the ringer for 10, 20, 25 years, man. There's so many things that have never been discussed that people are hearing for the first time. And I think that's that's interesting to people. And it's a challenge to me, quite honestly, uh, because you've been so generous over the last few years with your Russo fans, with the Russo brand and Pyro and Bally, Ballyhoo and everything. And it's been, you know, I have to kind of research what you've already done and also realize we're reaching a, a bigger audience. But, you know, for those people who like that full Vince Russo experience, you know, go to Russo'sBrand.com and you can check out how many shows a week is it now? Uh, we're over 10 again. You know, we, we've added more shows and we're over 10 again. You know, the three three main shows of the network are I do a Raw Smackdown review, uh, a very detailed review with Ben Hameen and, of course, the great Stevie Richards. We do a Castrating the Marks, bro, where we look at all the dirt sheet writers. And then we do a a, a news roundup uh, every week with Disco Inferno. Those are the three main ones. I do other stuff, but those are really the heart and soul of the brand. And, you know, that leads us in exactly what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about Vince Russo leaves WCW, and, and at the same time, very relatedly, um, the Radicals left WCW. Be, and well, let's talk before January 2000. So, you know, you do the first month, October, November, Starcade. At what point did it become apparent to you that the guys kind of giving you those looks, as you said before, whispering about you? Yeah. You know, at what point did it become overt? You know, Matt, I could tell you, and I don't think I've ever said this before. I can remember something that stands out so vividly in my mind. It was a it was a TV taping very early on. Maybe it was our second TV taping, maybe our third, very early on, where I was hanging out in the back and I was sitting on, you know, the. Uh, you know, one of those big cases where, you know, they store the audio or the video equipment. I was sitting on the case and I was sitting next to Bill Bush and it was just the two of us. OK. And I remember Bill Bush turned to me and he goes, man, he goes, this is fun. You know, I'm having a great time. This is really fun. And and I looked at Bill and I'm like, well, you know, bro, it's supposed to be fun. I mean, like, this is the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be having fun. And I mean, he was genuine. Like, he was like a little kid. Like, man, like, all the horror stories I heard and everything I heard about wrestling, like, this is fun. So my oh, just, point is... <laughs> just wait, but, Bill Bush. Just wait. Just wait, Bill Bush. <laughs> but that's my point, Matt. It can be fun, but it's almost impossible, bro. I know when the problem started. I know how the problem started. I wasn't oblivious to the problems. 
I knew what the outcome was going to be and nothing happened that surprised me. And I always go back to, bro, it all started with Kevin Sullivan and J.J. Dillon. Um, Every time I turned around, bro, they were having a sidebar. And the minute I would catch them in the corner of my eye, they would flee and go their separate ways. And that happened on many, many occasions. I'm talking about, Matt, I'm talking about less than a month in. And I I know what triggered it. Triggered it. I know exactly what happened. <laughs> you know, I knew it then, um, and I was like, "Okay, bro, let's 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 just let this thing play out." Because at the end of the day, they're, they're going to be the ones that pay for it, and not me. Uh, reading from the Nitro book. An assortment of industry veterans conveyed their concern over WCW's direction, including Ke- Kevin Sullivan. I told JJ, remember Sullivan, the Titanic has hit the iceberg and we've got two hours to evacuate. And so that's the kind of talk that's going on behind your back at the time. Does that and, 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 he, and No, and I got to tell you something, Matt. See, this is where, you know, insert anybody else and we're burying Kevin, Kevin Sullivan. Bro, during that time, Kevin Sullivan is serving as my friend. You know, you know, you know, he's he's involved, you know, booking meetings. I remember one time we went out to sushi together. So, you know, he's serving on my friend while he's saying this to J.J. Dillon. And Matt, I got to tell you something. I was a Kevin Sullivan, Mark. Kevin Sullivan, bro, the Dungeon of Doom and all that shit. The Varsity Club. I like that shit, bro. Even after the fact. I had Kevin Sullivan. I interviewed him on my show. I've run into him at conventions and stuff. I I don't have a bad thing to say about Kevin Sullivan. I really don't. Bro, that's the nature of the beast. It's, it's, It's the wrestling business, bro. As a man... Take Kevin Sullivan Sullivan away from wrestling. I enjoy my conversations with him. I learned a lot from him. I'm a huge fan of Kevin Sullivan. I watched a bit of that interview that you did with Kevin Sullivan. You guys didn't really get into the confrontational thing about what happened, right? You guys kind of just skirted around it a little bit. Was it uncomfortable for both of you to kind of get into it? Well, I, I don't. You know, like, bro, I know what happened. Like, I know what the facts are. I don't want to put, I could tell you this, Matt, after the, after all that shit went down and WW, WCW folded tent, bro, it was a couple of years later that I saw both JJ Dillon and Kevin Sullivan at a convention. And as a matter of fact, bro, I saw Kevin Sullivan at the front desk of a hotel and bro, I went up to him. Kevin, what's go, bro? He was shocked, like he 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 was totally shocked. I mean, I could I could read his face, and bro, you're talking about one of the best workers in the world. I could read his face, and he was like shocked. I I actually apologized to JJ. Maybe we'll get into the story later on in this show, but the same thing with JJ. I think you I told ap- it on a previous episode. Right. Yeah, I apologize to JJ and the look on their faces, they they could not believe it. But that's the thing with me, bro. When when, when I look at guys like this, when I look at guys like Bruce, when I look at guys like Eric, part of the reason Jim Cornette, part of the reason why there's no hatred on my part. It's the wrestling business, bro. It's like it's what the wrestling business makes you. And me being from the outside, I can see it as clear as day. Like, bro, Bruce Bruce ain't really like Bruce is. Eric really isn't like Eric is. But you put them in that environment or around that environment, and, bro, they can be not very nice people at times. Meltzer reports long before Russo was replaced, several wrestlers had not so privately talked about banding together against Sullivan, um, uh, Kevin Sullivan, because uh, he was seen as the person who would eventually get Russo's job, um, although the belief was not this soon. Um, does Is that surprising you that people were kind of expecting already Sullivan? Not at all. Not at all. Not not at all, bro. And I got to tell you something, bro. The the stand that the radicals took, I'll tell you right now, bro. I wish I could sit here and tell you that was pro-Russo. 
bro, that was much more anti-Sullivan than pro-Russo because they had no time to get to know me. Like, the, the, it's not like they were my friends, you know, it's not like Benoit was my friend and Eddie was my friend and Dean. We didn't even have the opportunity to become friends yet. So the stand those guys took was definitely more anti-Sullivan, less pro-Russo. There's uh, Meltzer also reports that the, the talk that Sullivan would get Russo's spot had been going on internally for weeks. And those who were friendly with Russo and some who just simply liked Russo because they hated Sullivan more had urged him, you, to use your power while you had it to cut Sullivan out of power. Never, bro. bro can I tell you something? Not one single person said that to me, ever came to me and said, hey, bro, you know Kevin's positioning for your job, blah, blah, blah. Not that conversation never took place with anybody, bro. I kept what I was seeing within. I, I knew what was happening from what I was seeing. There was not one single person, bro, who attempted to smarten me up. Not one. The, it goes on to say the belief was that you thought you could handle the situation, but what you're saying is that no one friendly to you, no one uh, who was friendly to your cause or who, were, who liked you came to you and said, dude, get Sullivan out. He's coming for you. No, and that was probably, bro, that was probably because they didn't expect it to happen as quickly as it did. That's probably why. Now, if it would have went on a little longer, I'm sure that would have happened. Bro, you, we're talking about less than three months here. So I, 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 I think people thought, okay, bro, they got to give this guy at least six months. So like, I, I, I think the fact that it was so quick, people weren't putting that much emphasis on it. Overtly, things started happening for you right about Starcade, According to the Nitro book, which isn't unkind to you, by the way. The Nitro book said on a Thursday afternoon before Starcade, Russo was summoned for a large meeting involving Bush, Dylan, Ferrara, Sullivan, and Nash, among others. That meeting did indeed take place. And then this, this is where I'm now hearing this shit. I'm sitting there not saying nothing. So, Matt, when they're all done with their opinions, bro, this is what it always goes back to with these freaking people, their opinions, JJ's opinion of the show, Eric Bischoff's opinion of the show, Bruce Pritchard's opinion of the show. That's what it what what the, what they think the show should be. So I sat there, said nothing. And then what did I say, bro? I said, why are we having this meeting when the numbers are going up? At that point, at the Starcade point, um, you know, you're about nine weeks in and the numbers on average were actually a little bit lower than they would be the nine weeks previous. Um, oh, yeah. No. I, well, yeah. I mean, I would say the nine months previous, but I, I'm going at, I'm going from where I picked up the show and I picked up the show at a 2.6. That was the last show you did, bro. I'm not, I'm not going back nine weeks. I'm not going back six months. The last show you did when I started was a 2.6. Right. And, and so by the time, a 2.6 was uh, October 11th, 1999. And, you know, by the end of uh, the ratings in December were 3.0, 2.8, 3.2, 2.9. And actually, you know, uh, like I said, the average in that nine weeks versus the previous nine weeks was lower, but January picked up big time uh, post Starcade. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Starcade uh, and, and the pay-per-view before. The buy rates were significantly down. I know you've said your job was ratings, but I think maybe pay-per-view rates are a reflection of of that being effective or not, you know, from uh, Starcade 1998 uh, did a 1.15, Starcade 99 did a 0 0.32. That's a significant drop. What do you attribute that kind of drop to? Is that? Oh, I mean, it, it's def. It's a couple of things. Number one, what was happening through the course of the year? The the pay per view buys were going down an entire year before we even got there. That's number one. Number two, thanks to me and Ed Ferrara, the WWE is kicking our ass. So at the end of the month, when you have money to pay for one pay-per-view, you're getting the WWE pay-per-view. You're not getting WCW. There's no more NWO. There's no more Hogan Nash and, and, and Scott Hall. Those days are over, bro. 
So now, you know, the WWE is kicking our ass. They're, they're buying the WWE pay-per-view. Number three, bro, we've got to tear down this house and start from the first brick. And that starts with the backbone and what's going on with television. Once you bring up the television ratings, everything else is going to follow, not just pay-per-view, but merchandise, house shows, ticket sales. The more eyeballs that are watching your show on TV, everything else will follow. So you've got to concentrate on the weekly TV product first. Bro, I didn't care about November's pay-per-view. I didn't care about December's pay-per-view. That that was already destroyed. That they, they already killed their own pay-per-view business. Bro, we got to go in here and start from from scratch. You know, with with the drop in the pay-per-view with the um, drop in the house shows, you know, you know, December of 99 was like, you know, 3,500 versus 10,000 the year before. Is there anything at the, in all those, the drop in merchandise, all that kind of stuff, it, it, any of that do you lay at the feet of Vince Russo of having any responsibility for any of Matt, that? Matt, you got to understand, I told them, guys, this is going to take a year. I told them that up front, I knew how long it took to rebuild the ratings because we did it at WWE. I made it clear to them, guys, you want this overnight? It's not going to happen overnight. We've got to tear down and build up. Matt, the freaking, I'm going to go back to baseball. The last two years, my team, the Giants, have sucked. They're going to suck this year because they've got to break down and they've got to build back up. They got to build up the farm system. They got to get a new fresh rookie crop in there. So you're going to have those thin years where you're rebuilding. And and I wasn't telling them years. I said, guys, we need a year. You've got to give me a year to get this back where it needs to be. So absolutely not. You you think I'm, I'm telling them that in October and I'm, I'm, I'm worried about a November pay-per-view? Hey, Vince, I don't know if you know this, but I am snowed in right now. And, you know, I wish I had ordered Wise Company freeze-dried food. It's freeze-dried emergency food that can be stored for emergencies like this. Tell you something, I bet you the people that just um, were victims of all those fires, bro. Situations like that, man, you've got to be prepared. And that's exactly what Wise freeze-dried foods are all about. Well, the Wise Company takes an innovative approach in providing dependable, simple, and affordable freeze-dried food for emergency preparedness and outdoor use. And Wise Company meals are designed to protect your most valuable asset, your family. Bro, what about job loss? What about job loss, bro? What about all of a sudden things get tight, bro, and you don't have the income for food to take care of your family that you once did? While you have that income, bro, you want to stock up with the Wise Company. Bro, the food never goes bad. It's free-dried. It's got a shelf life of 25 years. Bro, Matt, you could be eating out of the same bag of potato chips for 25 years, Mr. Goon. Well, I'll tell you what. With me, it might not last 25 years, but it, I might want to because they use the finest ingredients and food preparation technology to ensure the optimal freshness and flavor. And every recipe is created by a team of chefs and is unique to the Wise Company. Now, uh, this week, your listeners at Truth With Consequences, our listeners, can get any Wise emergency or outdoor food product at an extra 25% off the lowest mark price at wisefoodstorage.com when entering... Bro, bro, just enter bro at checkout. It's easy. The shipping is free. They also, Matt, they have a 90-day, no questions asked, return policy. So there's absolutely no risk involved in taking the initiative to get yourself and your family more prepared today. That's wisefoodstorage.com. Promo code BRO to get any Wise Emergency or outdoor food product at an extra 25% off and free shipping. We're going to uh, 
talk a little bit about some of the factors, you know, that kind of led to this as well. Um, one is Goldberg, uh, and we'll go down these kind of one by one as they happen. But Goldberg gets injured uh, December, I believe. Uh, well, bro, look, 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 can, can can we start with where I think this really started? And again, bro, this is where Vince Russo should be burying people. I love Ric Flair. <laughs> Ric Flair knows I love him. Ric Flair knows that, my God, every time I saw him at TNA, my face would light up like a child. And I would make the biggest fuss over seeing Ric. Okay, bro, I, to this day, I love Ric Flair. But, bro, if that's, if if I had to guess, that's where it started. The night we left Ric Flair off in the desert where we had a plan in mind, we knew where we were going, this thing had to play out, bro, I guarantee you he immediately got in the ear of J.J. Dillon. Him and J.J. go back, guys. We know the four horsemen. There's a friendship there. You know, Ric Flair, you know, wrestlers are all paranoid, not just Ric Flair. Ric Flair's thinking, holy shit, I just got dropped in the desert. This guy's not going to use me anymore. He's pushing all these young guys, yada, yada, yada. I guarantee you he got in J.J.'s head. That also at the same time, we had Hogan at at Halloween Havoc because we had to get Hogan off of TV. So I, I, I think we had Ho- Hogan lay down for Sting or Sting lay down for Hogan. I don't even remember. So now, bro, when you've got Flair and Hogan going to JJ and Bill Bush and, you know, and bro, there isn't a better worker in the business than Hulk Hogan. I, I mean, there isn't. And Bill Bush is so inexperienced. He had no idea like, OK, the, you know, you know, these guys obviously have an agenda, blah, blah, blah. He had no idea. But, bro, let, let's be honest. That's where it all started. And in spite of all that, in spite of the politics, Hogan might be upset talking to Bischoff, who's got some yes. weird meetings going on. And then yes. you've got Flair going back to JJ, who's with the company, Kevin Sullivan, who wants your job. Um, yes. In spite of that, you have to run the company, and the talent yes. you had to run the company, it starts diminishing. You know, don't where- don't say run the company, bro. Just say run creative, because I'm not I'm not running the company, bro. I have nothing to do with running the company. You only have so many characters that you can write with. One of the main people was Goldberg. In December 23rd uh, of 1999, Goldberg gets injured. Um, he is supposedly supposed to. Uh, break a windshield with an item. He drops the item. He tries to break it anyway. He's upset about something else that happened that night. And in doing so, he injures himself. And now he's out of your plans. Um, What was your reaction to Goldberg getting hurt? You know, bro, it's kind of like anything else. That, that That's not an excuse. When somebody gets hurt, it's not an excuse. You hear it all the time in, in sports. When bro, keep, people are going to get hurt all the time. That's not an excuse. Is it a devastating blow? Absolutely, without a doubt. Is it going to affect the entire deck? Absolutely, without a doubt. But I would never, ever use, bro, somebody getting hurt as an excuse because you got to bring somebody else up, bro. You got to get creative. You got to put steam on somebody else. I would never, ever say, oh, shit, bro, Goldberg got hurt and that effed me up. I would never say that, bro, because there are injuries in wrestling all the time. The Nitro that takes place before you leave WCW, you know, the plan is, uh, for the pay-per-view coming up, you guys believe it's sold out. Um, you have, um, Jeff Jarrett wrestling three different matches, I think. And then you also have Goldberg against Bret Hart and, um, you know, Goldberg is now out, so that can't happen. Um, and Jeff's out. Well, Jeff got hurt. Let's talk about, uh, the nitro before, yeah. um, yeah. You know, the the Nitro, before everything happened, Jeff Jarrett is in a steel cage match, closing out Nitro, takes a couple moves, takes a headbutt off the top from Benoit, and a... F- no, let me, can I tell you what, can I tell you what F... You no, know, bro, you know what F'd up Jeff Jarrett? Was the splash from Superfly Snooker. That, and, bro, Jeff was so hot at me over that, bro. Jeff never got hurt. 
that can custom. And bro, Jeff didn't even tell me it, it can custom. His wife called me without him knowing it and said, bro, he, he he's not, he won't tell you this, Vince, he's out of it. I, I've never seen Jeff like this. He's completely out of it. His wife called me to let me know. So how great of an idea was it to have Jimmy Snuka go off the top of the cage on Jeff Jarrett then? This is a guy who hadn't been in the main you know, uh, limelight. It's not like he did the jump off the cage every week or did it more than a couple times in his career. Um, how much responsibility is there in WCW put for putting Jeff Jarrett maybe in an unsafe situation? Bro, I, no, I don't think that's unsafe at all. I mean, I don't, bro. He, you know, you know, Snook had done that a million times. Bro, if Jeff would have thought it was an unsafe, Jeff would have said so. You know, me and Jeff were friends. It wasn't an employee. It wasn't that at all. If Jeff thought it was unsafe, he would have said something. But never in my wildest dreams did I think Jeff's going to get concussed, concussed off a splash. So there goes your three matches now uh, with Jeff Jarrett. And um, at least you still have Bret Hart. Bret Hart wrestled Starcade. He got a, a super kick not a super kick, a sidekick from Goldberg in the head. And he still wrestled. Uh, he wrestled the Nitro and appeared on the Thunder before this event. But then you get news, Bret Hart can't wrestle. He's got a concussion, right? Right, right. So now you're left with a pay-per-view to do. No Bill Goldberg. This is in the span of like two weeks, you know, a week and a half. No Bill Goldberg. No Jeff Jarrett, who's going to wrestle three matches. No Bret Hart. What is your plan at this point? This is what you talk about. And Matt, and th 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 I'm not, I I'm not using those injuries as an excuse. I'm not uh, people get hurt in wrestling all the time. You got to write around injuries every single week, bro. But this is where you call as a writer, Matt. Now we got to make chicken salad out of chicken shit. Okay, bro. We, we got what we got, bro. We've got to make this work. So, bro, what I did was I called a meeting with creative. It was me. It was Terry, um, you know, Bill Banks, uh, uh, you know, Disco Inferno. JB was probably there. Ed was probably there. But anyway, okay, guys, here are the, here are the circumstances. So, bro, we laid out um, there was going to be a like a, a Royal Rumble type um, um, battle royal to determine a new champion. Okay, bro. And the story basically was basically Sid is number one. Okay, bro. So we go through 30 guys and Sid's still in there. He's still in there, bro. By the time we get to the last guy and we kind of don't know who it is, Sid's in the ring by himself. Exhausted. Exhausted, bro. All of a sudden, number 30, here comes Tank Abbott. So now, bro, I'm putting myself in, in the reality zone. He is a guy that just wrestled for an hour. Here comes a UFC fighter as fresh as a daisy. So the idea was for freaking um, Tank Abbott to come in the ring and freaking knock out Sid Cold. Okay. Now, which is very believable, would have happened if this shit were real. And all of a sudden you're going off this pay-per-view. Holy shit. Who would have thought that Tank Abbott would be the WCW champion? Now, bro, do we know where we're going from there? Of course we don't know, bro. We don't have time to talk about that. This is like a Friday night or a Thursday night. The pay-per-view is freaking Sunday. So we, 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 we've, we have to figure out what we're doing now with all these injuries. Once we figure that out, now we can sit down the next day and we can figure out, okay, where are we going with this now? So, Matt, my, my memory isn't 100%. I would, I would, I think 
this late night meeting took place on a Thursday night where we came up with this idea and we were going to reconvene on Friday. Okay, bro, where do we go with the TV now? Where do we, where do we go with this? It's reported that you, um, it's reported that one of the final straws for Russo, and this is according to Wade Keller at the torch, uh, one of the final straws for Russo was you submitted a proposal on Friday afternoon for changes in the card due to Hart's concussion. Uh, you suggest that they hold a battle royal on the pay-per-view, which is what you just said, that Tank Abbott win the main event. And then Russo's opponents use that ammunition against you, saying that this was the final proof that your ideas were terrible. Um, uh, when... Did you start getting pushback? When did you start hearing? What was your next contact with WCW officials, uh, Bush or whoever? First of all, there was no proposal, bro. I didn't hand in a freaking proposal to anybody. I had a conversation with Bill Bush. It, it's so funny, bro, because Bill Bush, Vince, so, you know, what, what are you going to do? And I said, okay, bro, we all met creatively last night. This is what we're going to do, Okay. 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 Fine. No problem. Okay. Bro. An hour passes. See, the, these are the, these are the missing parts. Nobody has uh, an hour passes. I get a call from Bill Bush. I get a call from Bill Bush. You ready? Vince, you can't put the title on tank Abbott. <laughs> okay. So bro, I know immediately like Bill Bush don't know shit about wrestling. So I know immediately, bro, he bounced that off somebody probably JJ, you know, and it's like, and I, and I remember saying to him, Bill, we can put the title on anybody, bro. We make this shit up. <laughs> like, so what do you mean? I can't put the title on. What do you mean? I can't put the title on take out. We put the title on anybody. We, we, we make this shit up. So Matt, I remember at that time I knew it. I like, I'm like, okay, bro. He, 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 he had no problem with it. Um, but, you know, he, he, he didn't have enough confidence in himself to make a decision. So now we had to go to JJ. Now we had to go to Kevin or whoever he went to, right? Matt, this is a, my right hand to God. I hang up the phone with Bill Bush. I, I'm in the basement of my house. I remember where I was. I called my attorney. And I said, um. I said, bro, I said, you need to get me out of this contract. I said, I don't care what it takes enough. I, I can't work under these circumstances. I made a huge mistake. I don't give a shit about the money, bro. Whatever we have to do, you have to get me out of this contract. Swear to God, bro. That was my phone call with my attorney. Okay. Shortly following that phone call, Bill Bush calls me, bro. Th this is how, j this is just how weak they are. Okay. So he calls me and says, Hey Vince, you know, you know, we, we got, we got Hogan coming in and we got flair coming in and we're going to go over creative. And I'm saying to myself, Oh yeah, bro, you, you just picked up the phone and called Hulk Hogan and, and Ric Flair and they're dropping everything to come in for a meeting. Like, give me a freaking break. I, I didn't say that to bill Bush, I, you know, but I knew it like, bro, you know, stop it already. Okay. So I, I knew it was bullshit. But I'm like, OK, let me let me go into the office and let me see what Bill Bush has to say. OK, so that 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 that's where we are at that point. You have any questions off of that? No, no, not so far. Go ahead. OK, so, Matt, I swear to you. I walk into Bill Bush's office, Matt. His face is as white as a ghost. I swear to God. And Matt, I know immediately Bill Bush doesn't want to do this. Like this was the guy that was telling me two months ago what fun this was and what a great time we were having. I knew he didn't want to do this. So, uh, you know, of course, there's no Hogan and there's no flair. So he sits down with me and he starts the conversation with Vince. 
we decided uh, we we decide. First of all, who's the we? You're you're running the ship here. We decided we're going in another direction. You're no longer going to be head of creative. You're going to be part of a committee. Okay. Now, Matt, you got to understand literally less than an hour ago. I'm on the phone with my attorney saying, bro, get me out of this. I, I, I don't get me. I don't give a shit about the money. Get me out of this. Matt, when, when Bush is saying this to me, like when, once he says that to me at that point, like I'm not even listening to him. What's going through my mind is, bro, you guys just breached my contract. So like now, not only am I going to get out of this contract, you guys are going to have to pay me. (laughs) So like, that's what's going through my, I could give a shit like, bro, put Sullivan in charge, put JJ in charge. I want out of this. You, you're breaching my contract. So bro, I sat there as calm as a cucumber knowing I had him. And I said, I said, well, I said, Bill, cool. No no yelling, nothing, no mad. I said, well, Bill, I said, unfortunately, that's not what my contract states. I said, my contract states that I'm head of creative. I said, I have no interest whatsoever in being part of any committee. I said, so you need to call Brad Siegel. You guys need to figure out how you're going to pay me. And once you figure that out, give me a call at home and let me know. And I got up and I walked out of the office and that was it. Um, yeah, so that's kind of heavy. Um, but you know what's not heavy? And that is total engagement with Matt Kuhn. You know... Someone got the great idea to go ahead and just give me my own show. I'm going crazy with it. Fun bits, fun segments, a little current product talk, but also anchored by awesome interviews. First episode, we had a great interview with Joey Ryan. Last week, Lex Luger. This week, we have a very special episode with Jim Johnston. He doesn't do a lot of interviews, but he agreed to talk to me, musician to musician, and we're going to have that tomorrow as well as Paul Mr. Wonderful Orndorff and maybe something else. So check us out at TotalEngage.net or MLWRadio.com. And, of course, it is powered by WrestleZone, the most viewed wrestling website on the planet. Oh, yeah. And check out my new daily YouTube show. Just go to YouTube and search Total Engagement and Matt Coon, and uh, we'll have something up every day for you. Back to the show. That was it. You know, as far as, and we'll talk about the committee as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about the criticisms and maybe your response to them. You know, it's been said that you at the time, head of creative, uh, kind of uncompromising. Um, at the same time, there was a a way of thinking among kind of the old guard um, that you had devalued the titles so much. And I know you say they're made up, you know, nobody actually wins the titles. But when you have this kind of school of thought where you have, you know, the titles about to be given to Tank Abbott, the cruiserweight titles being contended between Oklahoma and Medusa, and the tag team titles are going back and forth between David Flair and Crowbar and Johnny the Bull and Big Vito, that maybe you didn't really understand what WCW was about. Uh, I know you don't feel that way, but looking back now, is, is it possible that maybe you could have been a little bit more understanding of that viewpoint? Matt, you, you got you you got to understand something. If the ratings are going south, I'm making a mistake, bro. And I know I'm making a mistake, and I know I need to do something to correct that. I know that, and I'm ready to take responsibility. And shit, Vince, you were wrong. Bro, when the ratings are going up slowly but surely, creeping up, going in the right direction over those first three months, in my mind and in my opinion, it's, it's, it's working. 
It's a positive. We're going in the right direction. So I'm, I'm not looking at increasing ratings as a negative, bro. But if you were to take a bigger view of it and to say, okay, the 13 weeks that I did versus the 13 weeks before I came in, the ratings are exactly the same. You went up a, a, a little bit from the four weeks previous to you coming in, but it's not like it was going in a direction so definitively that you could- Be, Matt, really you could, Matt I said a year. I said a year, so after three months, this is where we should be. Bro, Matt, you got to understand something. The first thing you got to do is stop the bleeding. That's the first thing you've got to do, bro. Stop the bleeding. Don't let these ratings go any lower. Stick your finger in the dike. So the first thing you've got to do is stop the freaking bleeding. And that's fair because they had they had stopped going down you had stopped yes that's that that's number one so stop the bleeding so that makes sense to me so you felt that dude this thing was sinking i've been here for three months it's not sinking anymore that's right it's, it's harder to like the economy it's harder to turn it around than to keep it going while it's going well you know so you, you know if you can stop the economy from going down and turn it around just even a little bit that's huge right that's that's the it stop the bleeding Okay, that's the first thing. Stop the bleeding. Don't let the ratings keep going down. Stop the bleeding. Now, right after you stop the bleeding, now you got to start seeing small victories. You, whether it's a tenth of a point, Matt, it doesn't matter as long as it's moving in the right direction. Because remember, bro, you're getting your building blocks in place. You're tearing down everything you they were doing, and now it's your vision. And now you're, you're putting the people in the spots that you want them to be. Bro, so you're in the re, you, you're stopping the bleeding, and you're in the rebuilding process. So after three months, bro, I'm exactly where I want to be. I'm the, this is what we talked about in the meeting. This is what we discussed. I, I didn't lie to you guys. I didn't sell you guys a bill of goods. This is exactly what I laid out to you. So now if you want to go in another direction, that's fine. But I'm not going to be a part of that direction. You're frustrated talking about this. You're a little heated talking about this in 2019. How pissed off and frustrated were you in 19, early 2000 when they're saying, Vince, you're part of a booking committee now. You're, you're going to be uh, man, sitting I'm, next I'm to Bob just, I'm, I'm just pissed off because like this is what we talked about, man. You you had me there for in Atlanta for two full days. I told you this, bro. I told you how long it took to turn the WWE around. I literally gave you a time frame and I told you, bro, I laid it all out to you. If you had an issue with it, then you shouldn't have fired me. But realistically, guys, I we need a year. We need a year to turn just like I just like when I left Vince McMahon. I said, Vince, you got a year to ride this wave. Look, look what happened after that year. It was the same thing here. Guys, this is you don't expect ratings overnight. It's not going to happen. I told them exactly what we were going to do. We were sticking to our plan, and that's the thing that pissed me off. If they would have said, Vince, we can't, we can't wait a year, I would have said, then don't hire me because I can't get this done in less than a year. Uh, by the way, Meltzer and Keller are much more um, uh, in your corner in nineteen in 2000 than they, than they are in 2019. Um, you know, um, Keller says... Uh, to judge you now, just before a lot of pieces were going to fall into place to make you look good, is unfair and bad business. Uh, Russo deserves his post back and an unobstructed chance to succeed. Well, does that surprise you that Wade Keller wrote that in early 2000? Yeah, yep. Because I'm, I'm sure the wrestling we were doing was not his cup of tea. It, it, it's not. It, it's not any of the writer's cup of tea. But one of the things that Keller uh, writes in this blistering indictment of bill bush uh he writes an article about bill bush 
and he says he never had a chance. Um, he was played by uh, J.J. Dillon, Gary Juster, Kevin Sullivan, Kevin Nash, um, and that uh, he says the old guard feared that Russo would succeed. Russo managed to give them a lot of ammunition to discredit him to Bush. I can hear all the arguments by the Russo critics. They're good arguments. Russo's arrogant and not nearly as smart as he thinks he is. You can let that one go. Um, uh, but that said, well, Russo- let, 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 let's not let's not let that go. <laughs> because let, let, let's talk about the arrogant, bro. It's got nothing to do with arrogance. I know what worked in the WWE. We, we just came off of a huge success where the rating was 1.9, bro. When we left, it was 7.9. I know what we did. I lived through it. I know how we got the casual viewers and the masses. So it, it's not arrogance, bro. It's, guys, there's a blueprint. This worked. I, I, uh, w- w- we can make this work over here. I got to be honest, though, Vince. Like, even if you're right, okay, even if you're right, if you say, if you think you have the answers and everybody else doesn't have the answers and you say, um, you know, uh, even even if you're right, you know, and you say it, um, it, it comes off as arrogant. As a member of the Arrogance Club of America, I've seen you at the meetings. Um, you have a little bit of arrogance because it is... I know what works, and I'm not afraid to tell you that. There's not a, I don't know if there's a better word than arrogance, and I'm not sure it's a negative thing. Would Would you maybe agree with that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm confident. I'm 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 confident that I know what I'm doing. That's not arrogance, bro. I'm I'm confident for a reason. But I, yeah, I I understand what you're saying, but it's not arrogance. It's experience, bro. He goes on to say. Keller does in this article, uh, this editorial on Bill Bush, um, that even though the criticism of you he feel might be accurate or might be something he agrees with, um, does the old guard, he asked, have the best interests of WCW in mind? No. Their professional no. lives are based around self-preservation. They yes. are masters of it with decades yep. of experience. They know how to play the game, yep. and they played Bush like a fiddle. Yeah, fa- 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 fast forward WWE circa 2019. Same exact. That's it. Nothing's changed, bro. That's the wrestling business. Nothing has changed changed I, I was about to say we went a full hour without you bringing up becky lynch and i was gonna like ring a bell or something yeah but i'm just saying bro that fast forward 20 years nothing's changed let's talk a little bit about that they know how to play the game and they played bush like a fiddle yeah um do you believe they did and how we we talked about kevin sullivan um how big a role did gary juster have kevin nash have in in these kind of things gary Juster played a huge role um, bro, I don't, I, I want to believe Kevin Nash didn't play a role because I, I considered Kevin Nash and me friends. You know I mean? We did work together at the WWE. I know Kevin was more hip and more open to new school and less traditional. I don't, I don't think, I don't think Kevin played a hand, but I, I don't know without a shadow of a j- the doubt, Jester, JJ, Sullivan, Hogan, Flair, I mean, without a shadow of a doubt. Once they took you out of power, they were kind of scrambling a little bit. Um, You know, they um, uh, considered Nash and they wanted to give Nash some power and also give him the title. He turned it down. Um, It ended up going to Sullivan. So let's talk a little bit about that. The fallout for the Sullivan thing is well documented. We'll talk about it in a little bit. But what does it say about Bill Bush and about Kevin Sullivan, about J.J. Dillon, that the person chosen was someone who would result in so many wrestlers being unhappy? How out of touch was he? How bad was he played? I got to tell you, I get off on this. I I get off on because, bro, let, let me go down the line with you. This happened to me with Kevin Sullivan. You know, uh, you know, Bruce Pritchard attempted it, but Vince McMahon was smart enough. And it was the same scenario with Eric Bischoff at TNA and, and, and what he did to me, the things he said about me to Dixie, the things he said about me to spike executives, 
because he wanted all the power. Can I tell you, this is what I get off on, Matt, and I'll explain it to you. When I work with guys like Kevin Sullivan, when I work with guys like Bruce, when I work with guys like Eric, after working with them for a while, I know what they're capable of. I know what they're good at, and I know what they can't do. Okay, bro? From a writing perspective, writing a show, formatting a show, getting everybody involved, storylines, characters, stuff making sense, compelling. Those guys can't touch me. Okay, bro? Now, on the other side of the coin, there are a hell of a lot of things they do better than me. A hell of a lot of things, but that's not one of them. So now, Matt, here's the thing. This is why I get off on this. When you politic, okay, bro, when I talk, when I'm talking politicking, I'm talking when you stab people in the back, when you lie, when you cheat, when you steal, when you do whatever you have to do to gain the power, okay, bro, once you gain that power, you've got to deliver. And bro, when you're incapable of delivering, you're going to fall flat on your face. So when, when, when I got called and all of a sudden I'm not part of a committee and Sullivan, because of his politicking is in charge, I know he's falling flat on his face because I know he can't do it. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying that. Eric Bischoff, Eric Bischoff, uh, Eric Bischoff achieved big time. Congratulations to Eric of running me out of TNA. He did exactly what he wanted to do. Go ahead, Eric. Go write the TV. Go write your aces and eights. You took two million people, bro, and you whittled it down to nothing because you politicked, you politicked, you politicked for the power, you politicked to get rid of Vince Russo. Now it's time to put up or shut up, bro. And because you can't write a television show, you failed miserably. So, bro, I'm not going to lie to you. I, I get off on the politicians because when it comes to the time of having to deliver you're gonna shit the bed, bro. And that kind of mentality you have now, you know, the perception of you now ranting and, and, and being upset and, and, you know, making your point, it all started with this. This is where it all started. Like you had success in the WWE. You were given a good contract for WCW. This is where the Vince Russo we know now the one yeah bro bro, bro let, let, let's be honest there was an attempt at wwe there what bruce bruce pritchett made his attempt bro bruce bro listen but you shake I, it off I and like, more powerful than ever though and more, i know. like bruce let let's be honest but let let's 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 call a spade a spade here bruce wanted the talent relations position so he relinquished creative Vince put him in that talent relations position that maybe Bruce wasn't suitable for. I don't know what happened, bro, but Vince took him out of that spot quickly. I think he has said he wasn't a good fit for that. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Okay. So Vince quickly took. So now what did Bruce want? Bruce wanted his spot on creative back. So now Bruce Pritchett goes to work. I told you about the creative services. Vince, people can't work with you. They can't get along with you. And I'm like, what the, f I'm going to drop it. What the fuck are you talking about, bro? I've worked with Debbie Bonanzio for years and years and years. All of a sudden I'm writing now and she can't work. I knew he was full of shit. I knew he was full of shit. So I went to Vince. And I'm like, Vince, I'm not, I don't play these games. I'm not, I'm not doing, I don't, yeah, the guy's bullshitting. Okay. I've never had a problem with this woman. Vince, if you want to put Bruce back in charge of creative, put him back in charge of creative. All right. I don't, I'm not good at this, bro. I just want to do my job. 
that when I told Vince that deadpan, I'll take care of it. That was the end of that. Okay, bro. There was nobody to take care of it at WCW and there was nobody to take care of it at TNA. I guess what I want to get at, and I'm going to get to it because I'm freaking determined to is what happened to you, Vince Russo, the person, your relationship with the wrestling industry on that day, um, with, uh, with the WWE thing, you, you know, you came out looking like a rose so much so that WCW gave you the good contract when you were, you know, you get called in this meeting, you get these phone calls, you talk to your lawyer, you call back, um, you know, there's a group of people that are willing to be on a committee with you. There's already people in a circle talking about you. At this point in time, your day-to-day -day life, your day-to-day -day job, the thing that you're, you know, as you said, you were obsessive about wrestling at, at that point. Who did Vince Russo have? Were you just by yourself? I was by myself. Completely. Completely. 100%. When, and I know you enough now that when something goes down, you, you got to talk to somebody. You got to call somebody. You text somebody. You know, you, you vent out, and it's a healthy thing. At that point in time, was there anybody in the business that you could call? That Matt, I fell into the deepest, darkest depression I ever experienced in my life. Because you got to understand something, bro. I was an East Coast guy. Okay, bro, I moved from Long Island to Connecticut. Connecticut and Long Island are one and the same. Okay, bro, I moved to Atlanta for this job. So now, bro, um, my family's in Atlanta. My kids just started school. I don't want to move them again because it's not good for my kids. So now... Not only do I want to have nothing to do with WCW, not only do I want to have nothing to do with wrestling, I'm living in a place that I can't stand. But for the good of my family, I've got to stay there and suck it up. I was in the deepest, darkest depression I ever suffered in my life. What, is, what does that look like? Um, when you I totally isolate myself like I'm, I'm living in my basement. Um, I'm th there's no communication with my wife. There's no communication with my kids. Um, one day is turning into the next day, turning into the next day. I swear to God, Matt, all I cared about was every two weeks I went to that mailbox and waited for my check to come. And then that's it. That is it, bro. That sounds miserable, dude. Miserable. Matt, at that point in time, I, I'm, I'm being honest with you, bro. I was not suicidal, but I understood why people committed suicide. I, I understood it. I got it. I know why people pull the trigger. That's where I was. So that kind of depression, that kind of, those kind of thoughts – you know, aren't just triggered by a job thing. It's, it's something you've struggled with since you told me and you told everybody, you know, that depression is a thing. Um, when you're alone with your thoughts for those weeks, you know, where you're getting those paychecks, um, what, what consumed you? Because when you're depressed, you know, you get consumed with things. Is it, was it consumed with more of those mother, those motherfuckers, they fucking did me. I didn't get a chance. Or was there a part of you, which it sounds like it would have to be that says I'm no good. I messed up. I failed. No, not at all, bro. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, can I tell you what I'm consuming? Bro, can I tell you what may have saved my life? Did you hear may serious laugh, I you, got you may that, laugh at this. Did you hear serious you may, I got? <laughs> yeah, no, Matt, come on. I stop. Tried. Matt, you want to know what? I, I'm not bullshitting you. Do you know what may have saved my life and what I consume myself with? First of all, Matt, I wasn't – you got to understand something. I wasn't those son of a bitches. They only gave me three months. F them. Matt, I was glad to be out. I was glad to be out. I didn't want the call back. 
I didn't want them to call me back. Bro, if my check's in a mailbox every two weeks, I'm fine for the next 18 months, whatever it is. I did not want them to call me back. I did not want the job. Just pay me my money and, and let, you know, let, let, let me live in Atlanta for a couple of years and then I'll move again. You know what I'm saying? Like that was the game plan. Matt, I swear to God, what saved me at this point, somebody, uh, somebody turned me on to fantasy baseball. And I started playing fantasy baseball when nobody could F with me. I no, nobody's going to mess with my Vince. Why are you trading this guy? Why are you? No, bro. I can run my own team. And maybe that was the correlation. I became obsessed with fantasy baseball. And that's all I did was play fantasy baseball. I didn't, I was not saying those. I did not want to go back. Yeah, no one's gonna go. Uh, hey, hey, uh, Vince, Kevin Sullivan's now the manager of your baseball team. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And bro, I'm telling you, that that had something to do with it. I'm managing my own fantasy baseball team. Nobody could tell me what to do. But previous to that, when you're, you know, when you're in your down point from this, you know, um, what is it that consumed your thoughts? What was it that caused that depression? The fact you, you know, I'm stuck in this town. You know, I, 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 I'm not working or whatever it is. There must have been something deeper in you that kind of triggered that depression just from losing this WCW job. Matt, I don't think it was that. Can I tell you what it was? And I hate to say this because I'm going to get all kinds of heat, Matt. Oh, yeah, because you, you hate heat so much. I hated Atlanta, man. It, it, it was so not me. So now I, the only reason I moved here was because of this job. Now I'm stuck here, bro, because I'm not I'm not going to do that to my kids. I'm, I can't I can't move them all over again. And, and that was it, bro. Now, now I'm living in a place I hate. I mean, that that was the tough bro. Bro, seriously, if I move, if I had moved to Colorado, I, I think I might have been OK. You know, I mean, because I, I love Colorado. I go out places. I do things. I, I, I despised Atlanta, bro. One person in this committee that we haven't talked about much is Bob Mould. Bob Mould was a musician. Uh, he was in. <laughs> we'll get. We'll get to it. You, get, you know. You get your say. Um, he was in Husker Du, and then he was brought on as kind of a creative guy before you got on. Um, it said that he had left because he was frustrated with his role under with you. And um, after you left, he was part of the committee. Talk a little bit about Bob Mould. Oh, my God, bro. Bro, that's like that's like Bob Mould bringing me into Husker, too. <laughs> All right, bro. It's the same freaking thing. We, we're going to bring Vince Russo into Husker, do because Vince Russo likes likes music. It's the same. What a freaking slap in my face. But freaking Bill Bush is somehow, some way friends with Bob Mole from Husker Du. He's a mark for Bob Mole. Bob Mole is a wrestling fan. So somehow or another winds up as part of the committee. I mean, come on, bro. Like you, you that is that what was such a sign of this. No credentials. Nothing, bro, because Bill Bush is a mark for Bob Mole and Huskadoo. Bob Mole is now sitting in on WCW creative. Come on, bro. Like, st seriously. But, you know, you're not that close minded that when you meet somebody, you just assume because he's a musician, he has nothing. There's to a right way to do it. Don't do it that way. You know, you just don't throw somebody in there. Introduce him to Vince. Let Vince have a conversation with him. Let Vince pick his brain. In, in other words, I'm, I'm, I'm friends with Billy Corgan. OK, if you put Billy Corgan in that spot and I got to talk to Billy and I got to hear Billy's thoughts on wrestling and know Billy's history. Fine. I've got no problem. But when you're just putting the guy in there with no explanation, no formal introduction, bro, I never had a one on one conversation with the guy ever. What was he brought in after you were hired? No, I, I, I think I think he might have been there when right, I started. I so. He was like just there. And I'm like. 
There was no introduction. There was no one-on-one conversation. There was no Bob Mole coming up to me saying, hey, Vince, you mind me? You want to grab lunch? And so uh, he was brought back as part of this committee as well. Uh, but it, he wasn't someone that you kind of respected or thought contributed a lot to WCW. No, and that, again, that had a lot to do with the way they freaking handled it. They handled it the wrong way. Like, like I said, ch- change the scenario. Dixie Carter wants me to work with Billy Corgan. Okay, I have a conversation with Billy Corgan. I hear what he knows about wrestling and how deep he goes into it. Fine, no problem. I got no problem with Billy Corgan being on it. But when when, when none of that takes place, I'm, I'm looking at this guy saying, like, this guy is here because you're a mock for him? The one thing and the one mistake, and I guess we'll transition just a little bit, uh, and Meltzer and Keller and the book, the Nitro book, all relay this fact, is that one thing that Bill Bush really messed up on was that he underestimated how much more popular you were than Kevin Sullivan. That bringing Kevin Sullivan, that was a mistake because of how much bad feelings existed between the wrestlers and Kevin Sullivan. How in tune were you to the fact that um, the wrestlers were more uh, happy that you were there than if Kevin Sullivan would be put in charge? Well, because I knew they never got their opportunity before in their minds and they weren't going to get it now again. I mean, that, 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 that's exact. They knew they were going to get an opportunity with me. They knew they were starting to get opportunities with me. In particular with, you know, what, were there any other options presented to you or any other options that you came up with in the wake of all the injuries? Uh, because the Tank Abbott thing was used you know, as, as kind of, right. you know, what if, what if there was other ideas, you know, that one idea that you had that you, you got, you know, attached to. Well, man, it, it's what it is in wrestling all the time, bro. It, it, it's always this in wrestling, bro. There was a, com- we got together as a committee. We got, and all of a sudden that turns into Vince's idea, you know, j- just like David Arquette, you know, when, when Tony Schiavone, you know, pitched that I called everybody back in the room together. I I didn't make that decision on my own. I called everybody and I said, guys, Tony just mentioned this to me. What do you think? Every single person was on board. Then all of a sudden when somebody shits on it, oh, that's, that's Vince's idea. Bro, several people agreed to this. This was not this was not Vince making a decision without getting together with the committee. We got together and discussed this. We talked about this on the Patreon version. We had a show completely dedicated to the subject of Ed Ferrara and Vince Russo. Of course, if anybody was to be in your corner, it was Ed Ferrara. And you said on that Patreon show that you for a while had... Um, bad feelings about Ed Ferrara, about the way he handled it, about the lack of loyalty. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your interactions with him in the wake of this decision by WCW? Yeah, he, he, wa- he wasn't in my corner, bro, but he, he, he wasn't in my corner because he had to worry. He, Ed had to worry about Ed and his wife and Ed and his wife moved to Atlanta, just like I did. And all of a sudden, if the job isn't there for Ed Ferrara, you know, then what? You know, you know, what does he do next? So, like, I understand that, but he was he was not in my corner fighting for me. Uh, what did early two thousand Vince Russo think of Ed Ferrara? What was your uh, what were you thinking then, as far as um, the loyalty and maybe maybe he could have done something? Maybe if he stuck with you, looking back now, you're magnanimous and thinking, you know, his family and all that. But I think I, 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 I just know and I could tell you to this day, I know Vince Russo would have would have handled it totally differently. Rules reversed. What would Vince Russo have done? I would have I would have walked with him. And did you feel that Ed Ferraro owed, owed you that because you brought him there? I don't feel he owed me anything, but I I felt that would have been the right thing to do. And um, was that another part of kind of the depression and the anger? Was that the one guy, you know, the one guy, you know, the relationships you made 
maybe didn't mean anything because nobody was in your corner. But the one guy you Matt, brought with you wasn't. Matt, the, the 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 depression and the anger was the wrestling business. It 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 all falls under the wrestling business. So like that 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 was just part of it, bro. Like I, at that point. I would have preferred to be on the back of a garbage truck than to be working in wrestling. As someone who hustled your way in owning a video store to writing for the WWE magazine and hustled your way up from the WWE magazine to being the head of creative to hustling your way to being the head of creative of the entire company of WCW um, was there a part of you that has said, what have I done? Have I wasted these years of my life in this terrible industry? Not at all, bro. Because when things went crashing down at, at WCW, I opened up my own business in Atlanta and I, 1 billion percent, uh, enjoyed doing that much more than I did working in the wrestling business. Um, transitioning a little bit to the four guys who ended up leaving. Uh, it ended up being where there was a meeting. They said anybody who wants to leave can leave, but they made a couple of people happy. A couple of people weren't welcome at WWE. Um, and so it ended up being those four leaving, Saturn, Malenko, Guerrero, Benoit. Um, when did you first hear that those four guys well, I'll failed. tell you what happened, and this this story's never been told before either. I don't think, bro. I think this is a Mac Coon TWC exclusive. Excellent. I read it online, and I'll be honest with you, I was getting great joy out of the chaos. Great joy reading about it online. But then, the person who did call me was Shane Douglas, because those four guys completely screwed him, man. And, bro, I got to tell you something about Shane Douglas. I don't <laughs> – bro, you know how I tell you you can't trust any wrestler? They're all full of shit. Bro, there is something about Shane Douglas, like, where I just kind of believe every word he says. <laughs> like, I, I watch shoot interviews with Shane Douglas. Shane Douglas can say anything, and I kind of believe Shane Douglas. I My experience with Shane Douglas is – he was always a stand-up guy. And, bro, maybe he's been working me for 20 years. But I always found Shane to be a stand-up guy. And Shane called me because those guys went to the WWE behind his back. WWE didn't want him. They didn't call him. They wouldn't return his phone calls. And freaking Shane was devastated at the time. And I remember him calling me, asking me what to do. And uh, did you say, uh, uh, why are you calling me? Or did you did you say, here's what you should do? What was the advice you gave him? No, I just said, Shane, you, you've been there once. Like, I was there with you. <laughs> like, you were miserable there, bro. Like, why would you even want to go? I, I understand, bro. You're hurt by your friends. The fact that they're not calling you and they did this behind your back. I get that. But, I mean, my God, bro, like, that's probably the last place you want to be. What was it about you that made Shane Douglas comfortable with calling you um, as opposed to Ah, You know, bro, because we worked at each other. We worked with each other at when he was Dean Douglas. And, like, the, the click and those guys made his life miserable. And, like, I was his friend back then. And um, I was in his corner back then, so we, we already had an established relationship. It said that maybe, you know, you were kept under contract, you were put on the sidelines, your contract would not be bought out. And maybe the purpose of that was in case this shit went belly up, which it did, um, they could call Vince Russo again. Was there a part of you that thought, wow, they could call me back into work again if they put me in charge of creative again. I don't want to do it, or I want a second chance, or... No, was no, I, I, I didn't even want to think about that, Matt. I did not want a second chance. I did not want to go back. I just wanted to make sure they paid me for the duration of two years. That's all I, that's all I cared about. When you said um, what you're depressed about and what you really had a lot of animus in your heart about was quote unquote, the wrestling industry. 
you didn't feel that way prior to this moment. I don't think so. This was a very definitive, pivotal moment in your life, was it not? Well, man, you got to back up a little bit, bro, because I, I've said this before. Bro, when I went to WCW, bro, at that point, I was emotionally, uh, mentally, physically done. I, I, I gave so much to Vince and so much during my time at the WWE, I was done. So in my mind, I was like, bro, suck it up for two more years. S get as much money as you can. Suck it up for two years. Bankroll as much as you can. And then go into business for yourself. So like I, I, I was done before day one, bro. Did you think it was not even a possibility they would call you back? No, I, I knew it was. Because I, I knew those guys were going to fail miserably. Why did you think that? Because they, 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 they politicked their way there, and now they had to deliver, and they didn't know how to deliver. For the same reason that Keller said earlier. Yes. We put this question out to Twitter um, about your exit. Just a couple of questions from Twitter. Of course, follow us at Russo Kuhn. TWC. Of course, you can follow Vince Russo at the Vince Russo. You can follow me at Matt Coon Music. Um, it just of those um, who jumped. Uh, you know, those there was a as I said earlier, there were some on the periphery who were very much in the mix who did not jump. Kidman, Shane Douglas, Conan. Um, who do you think could have made the biggest impact on the WWE uh, if they had left too? <laughs> God, bro, I would have always loved to see uh, Conan Absolutely. at WWE. Absolutely. But there was always, from day one, I, I don't know if it was him and Pritchard. I mean, there, there was something happened, bro, where there was Conan, he from day one, and he was never going to go there. there. The story from Bruce Pritchard is peculiar in that he says that Conan called him and he said, Hey man, it's me, K Dog. It's K Dog, man. You got anything for me? And Bruce Pritchard's like, I don't I don't know who K Dog is. Like he didn't know who Conan was. Um, or he didn't know that K Dog was Conan. And he's like, All right, well, you know, and he talked to him on the phone, and it's me, K Dog. He didn't know who it was. But Conan disputes that. Um, you feel that um WDE would never have given Conan a chance, so you know, it was a wasted phone call. And bro, he Bruce did that. Bruce did that with Disco Inferno of all people. Bro, when Bruce was in that spot, like, let's be honest, Bruce got off on the power and people kissing his ass. That that wasn't me, bro. I, I, I don't I don't want people to freaking kiss my ass. I don't want people to cater to me. I don't want people to be afraid of me. Freaking, I wanted to bring Disco into the WWE. So Bruce was talent relations. Bruce had one conversation with the Disco Inferno, didn't like the way Disco answered his questions, so Disco never worked for the WWE. So what you're telling me about Conan sounds like a very, very similar conversation. Another question um, from Twitter. Uh, this is from um, Anthony P. I'm checking my volume here. Hold on one second. There we go. Um, Whoops. Why was Vince you so high on Benoit? Was it because he was just a good wrestler? Because it doesn't seem like Benoit would be your cup of tea. You know, I, I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't high on Benoit. I mean, I wasn't. Like, I. I, I didn't know. Like, literally, bro. This was going to be. I'm going to give you guys the ammunition. You're going to go out there. You're going to get the television time. And, you know, this really was grabbing the brass ring. Like some of you guys are going to shine. Some of you guys are going to fall short. You're all going to have the same opportunity. I can tell you this, bro. I'll, I'll never forget this, though. I remember going years back, bro, when I was a magazine writer. They brought in Benoit to have a dark match with Owen Hart. And I watched that match and I was like, holy shit. And of course, Benoit and Owen knew each other and they're very familiar with each other. I went to Pat Patterson and I'm like, bro, like, are you going to hire this guy? 
And Pat turned around to me. He goes, he goes, hire him. He goes, what are we going to do with him? The guy can't talk. And like, but I, I remember seeing that performance and it, that match blew me away. There's something about Benoit that kind of jumped out at the, jumped off the screen, right? Yeah, it was unique. What was your reaction to what he did and how he died? Mm. I don't know. I mean, bro, how do you react to that, man? I mean, just total, total, total shock, man. Total shock. The um, And, you know, it, to this day, it still feels a little uncomfortable to talk about him, right? No, it absolutely does, bro. But I always think about, you know, how much how much play did steroids have to do with that, you know, bro? Yeah, and, and of course, concussions, you know. Right. And with those four, you know, that left, um, you, you had been there three months, so you probably had some idea. Uh, those four, could you rank them in order as far who do you think would be have the biggest impact or who do you think, uh, you know, from one to four, like is Guerrero first or how would you rank them? At, bro, at that time, I don't think I had seen them enough. I, I mean, I really don't at that time. I don't think I'd seen them enough. Uh, bro, if it were me, if we're going on looks alone – Bro, I probably would have had Saturn first just because Perry was so freaking unique and nobody looked like him. Nobody had his personality, bro. He really had like a quirky personality. Um, pro it, to me, character wise, he jumped off the page. We're left now with you leaving WCW with uh you maybe being depressed and you you know getting your check every two weeks uh the radicals have now gone um you've decided co to completely leave the wrestling industry to start your own business at this point right yeah yep um yep. and decided to leave it all behind you know you you're brought in a few months later we're going to talk about that at length soon probably but what convinced you to come back I, I had to fulfill my contract. So it, it, what was the fo phone call that you got? What was the contact you got? What was your reaction? With uh, Brad, Brad Siegel called me. I want you to meet so-and-so at a restaurant. And I'm like, oh, God, no. Because I knew it meant two things. Was Eric Bischoff? I knew it meant I was going back to work, and I knew it meant he wanted me to work with Eric Bischoff. And I think we're going to leave it as a cliffhanger right there. So that is the story of Vince Russo um, leaving WCW and the fallout that happened with the Radicals leaving WCW. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll take some questions on this on Twitter. Um, we'll put something out there and maybe follow up next week with a little bit more. But for now, Vince, it is time for Are You Kidding Me, Bro? with Vince Russo. What is going on in the mind, in the outrage of Vince Russo in February of 2019? Uh, you, you really want to know. I, I, I do, and I think the listeners do as well. You always get me in trouble. Who... Who, what, what idiots, what mindless, clueless imbeciles do the WWE think they're getting over on by putting China in the WWE as a member of DX? Bro, this is so typical WWE bullshit you guys you got you guys should be embarrassed you should be ashamed it's laughable if you don't think anybody with a brain doesn't see right through you as special especially you hunter 
you, 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 you guys are freaking ignorant. First of all, let me make something perfectly clear. I don't want to shit on it too badly. And I'll tell you why. Because Joni's mother is very excited. And bro, let, let, let me, let me specify this. Joni Lauer and her mother did not have the greatest relationship when Joni was alive. There, there was not a mother daughter relationship. Okay. It was far from it. But the fact that her mother is now taking great joy of Joni going, I don't, I don't, I don't want to shit all over it. But first of all, and I just spoke to Medusa this past week and I, I've said this to Medusa before. And I think she gets pissed off at me saying this because she's at the hall of fame, bro. Let me tell you something. If there is anybody out there that needs the vindication of Vince McMahon to think you're worthy, you're out of your effing minds. Okay, bro. That's why I not, it will never happen. I would, I would probably be the first guy to say thanks, but no thanks. I don't need Vince McMahon vindicating me. Okay, bro. And no wrestler should should be so excited because they're getting the vindication of one man. And until you get that vindication, you're worthless. Bro, if you put your years in the WWE, okay, the fans vindicated you. The people in the locker room, the people you worked with vindicated you. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but it's validated. Validate. That's what I said, Matt. Validated you. Okay, bro, you've been validated. Joni Lauer was validated decades ago when she was on TV and the fan response. And not, more importantly, the locker room and the people that worked with her loved her and a daughter. She was valid. We don't need the validation of freaking Vince McMahon. But, bro, to, to appease people that have been hounding you when China going in the Hall of Fame, when China's going in the Hall of Fame, when China, now you're going to put her in the Hall of Fame as one of five or six people. Guys, are, are you that petty? Like, I, I swear to God, bro, I'm the father of three kids. Bro, if, if I had a wife and a kid and kids, how could I be that petty? Like, bro, it is so petty. It is so transparent to anybody that knows you and know how you run that company. And, and bro, it's like it's not even sickening. It's embarrassing. Like you you guys should be freaking embarrassed. If if you think people with a brain don't see what you're doing, it's freaking embarrassing bro and you know what bro Vince, as far as i'm concerned vince mcmahon can keep his validation I, I don't i don't need vince mcmahon knighting me or vince mcmahon giving me his seal of approval that means nothing to me bro okay bro people talking about the attitude era 20 years later that means something to me people remembering that having memories thanking me for their childhood that means something to me. Same with China. Bro, there were millions and millions of young girls, teenage girls, idolizing China, wanting to be like China. The powers that she exuded. That's her validation, bro. Not sneaking her in the Hall of Fame as one of six people. Give me what, bro. One of these days, they're going to grow up at the WWE. And, bro, I'm telling you, slowly but surely, all this stuff, guys, is going to come back to pay, to bite you in the ass. Bro, it's called karma. There is such a thing of karma. You get out what you you get back what you put out there, bro. That's what you get back. And slowly but surely, bro, as as your numbers join to bro, bro, let, let's face it, bro. You made your money last year off of the Fox deal because you worked Fox. Wait till Fox sees the ratings. Wait till Fox see what they bought and your Saudi Arabia deal because so, the Saudis thought that the ultimate war and Andre the Giant were going to headline the card. Okay, bro, take take those two deals away. Let, let, let's look at your numbers. 
Let, let's really look at your numbers minus those deals. Bro, it's karma. You keep putting shit out there, you're going to keep getting shit back, bro. I'm a little confused because on the one hand, you're saying that China doesn't need the validation. And at the other, t- at the other side, you're upset that she's not getting the full measure of validation, that she's going with the group. I'm of the opinion that this is a great way to get her in right now, you know, and that it it seems very natural. DX, you couldn't exclude her from DX, and she's included because of DX. She is in the Hall of Fame. Um, What is the objection? I don't, I'm not sure I understand what the objection is her. Uh, You you feel that she should have gone in by herself instead of with DX? Is that... That if you're first. bro, if you if you're go first of all, like I said, bro, I'm I'm not talking out of both sides of my mouth. I don't think China needs the validation of of, of Vince McMahon. It, I I, I it, it, it's ridiculous, bro. I, but here's where I'm like, but okay, a her mother's happy. B I think China really wanted to go in, and C. I know there's a lot, a, a large amount of the fan base that wanted her to go in. So, like with with those three things, like I'm not, I'm not going to shit on that. And, and like I said, bro, I really believe her herself. I really, bro, I believe the validation was important to her. A- after everything that happened to her at the WWE, I think that validation was important to her bro the things i'm telling you i told her i i said these things to her before she passed away you've you've proven yourself you validated yourself so because there is a a large base of people that want her in i'm not gonna shit on it but what i'm saying is bro if you're gonna do it do it the right way like do it the right freaking way bro you you mean to tell me that sunny is more Hall of Fame worthy than China? Like you, you can actually sit there and tell me that Sunny brought more to the table to that company than China. I, I mean, come on, bro. If you're gonna do it, do it. Don't 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 do it where okay, bro. We're gonna bring her in under the guise of five or six people because we're not gonna give her the spotlight. I mean, come on, man. So instead of seeing it as a great way to get her in. You think it's a way of sneaking her in. Exactly. Yeah. To, 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 to pacify all, all, all those people, bro, you know, they're, they're getting emails every day. They're getting tweets. They're getting buzzed every day. Every time this year comes around, put China in the hall of fame, put China in the hall of fame, put China. Okay. We're putting her in the hall of fame. Now are you happy? Come on. Can I do a double gimmick this week? Oh, you want another one? Uh, are you kidding me, bro? I want another one, bro. Okay, here we go. Go ahead. I want another one because I'll forget it by next week because I'm old. Okay, okay, God, God forbid. Let's, let's bro, go. I swear to God. Talk about embarrassing. Whoever produced, wrote, or was involved in that Becky, not Becky, I'm sorry, that Bailey, Boss, uh, uh, Tamina, Nia Jax segment on Raw. Bro, literally, not only should you guys all be fired from the company, you should never be allowed to ever produce anything again outside of the grade school level. You should never, ever be able to write anything again other than um, other than for a mime. Guys, that is embarrassing. I have seen I have seen indie shows where I have seen performances and I have seen dialogue and I have seen the written word performed. A million times. I mean, that that was worse than anything I ever saw on any indie show. And I mean, for you to put put your performance out there, he 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 was the promo, bro. You go now. I go. You go now. I go. It's your turn. I go now. You go, bro. I I I would never in my wildest dreams embarrass 
a performer that that I was working for the way the way they embarrassed everyone in that segment. Bro, for you to actually write down dialogue of a wrestler saying we're changing the world. If I hear one more wrestler, bro, say how they're changing the world, I, I literally just think I'm going to freaking vomit. But anybody involved or that had any take in that, I don't care who you are. I tell you right to your face. You have no business doing what you're doing. That that was embarrassing, bro. And in a word, um, how could it have been better? What, what could you have done? What would Vince Russo have done differently? L- l- let, let the freaking girls react. <laughs> let it be real. Stop with the shit. We didn't. I didn't do this. We did that. Bro, every freaking person goes out there and pandas to the crowd. Whether And first of all, she's the boss. The fact that you're the boss, and I'm not talking to Sasha. I am a fan of Sasha. I'm talking of those writing to Sasha. If Sasha is the boss, these people can't be her equals. Do you not understand that? If Sasha is the boss, she cannot be saying, we did this together. That's not what bosses do. Bosses are in charge and people are underneath them. So if, if you want her to pander to the crowd and you want her to be the baby face and, you, and, and, and you, we all did this together, this is our title, please stop calling her the boss. Because that's the, the boss has a negative connotation. The, like, re- honestly, do I need to explain this to you guys? Seriously? Um, when, when, when you hear boss, what do you think of when I hear boss? I hate my effing boss. I hate the word boss. Power. Somebody in charge. That's not you working together with somebody. So what, it, 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 do, seriously, do you guys not have these conversations I think it's fair to assume they don't. I think it's fair to assume that, you know, that you put the guys out there, the ladies out there, and they talk, and people are supposed to like it. But for your viewpoint, it was one of the worst segments you've ever seen. Oh, my bro, it was literally you. you he, he, okay, here are my lines. Now it's your turn. All right, I just gave my lines. Now it's your turn. It was, oh, my. Oh, please, man. You're killing these girls. Well, I'll tell you what's not killing us is the great downloads we've been getting, and we want to thank everybody. And also, you know, I, I have this new show, Total Engagement, uh, with Matt Kuhn. You can find all your podcast platforms. Had a great interview with Lex Luger this past week. Oh, is that the one you were working on? Yeah, man. Lex is great, man. Oh, awesome. No, Lex is great, bro. That's awesome. He's the ni- He's like the nicest person I've ever yeah. met in my life. Yeah. He's just the best. Uh, and and uh, of course, uh, you can check that out at totalengage.net. Or if you want more Vince Russo, you go to the brand. Apparently, we're back up to 10 shows a week. And even though you're moving, the work is not stopping. What's going on on the brand this week? Oh, uh, you yeah, know, we, we got a lot going on in the brand. And like I said, bro, I, I cut down on some of my shows because I really, really wanted to concentrate on the big shows. I mean, this past week, me, Ben Hameen, and Stevie Riches, bro, we spent over two hours on Raw and SmackDown. And, bro, we don't we don't just critique the show. We tell you, like, this is where it went wrong and why. And this is what we would have done and why. I mean, we really, really, really thoroughly look at the show. I mean, right after this show in a couple of hours, I'm going to record Disco. We're going to talk about all the news. But uh, yeah, guys, check it out. It's less than a dollar a week. It's Russo'sBrand.com. And make sure to check us out here next week on Truth With Consequence.